Hello, my name is Michael Taylor and welcome to the Trader Interview Series. I'm delighted to have Rocco Stridham on with me today. Good afternoon, Rocco. How are you doing? Uh, no, such a pleasure. I'm absolutely stoked to be on this uh, show of yours. Yeah, thanks. So you're an entrepreneur focused on finance, energy, and media. Is that correct? Do you want to tell us a bit more about yourself, please? Yeah, I don't want to bore your listeners to death, but <laughs> I'm basically sure I'm, <laughs> I'm coming. I had a law degree, right? Or I have a law degree, but I never wanted to be a lawyer, right? Because if I, like even now, like, I don't believe in pigeonholing someone into something. Say, oh, you are a trader or you are an investor or you are a podcast host or whatever. It's like we all are multifaceted and multi-talented like talented individuals. We can do many things. But like just to sort of give you a bit of background, um, I spent most of my professional career in the energy in, uh, industry, in downstream oil. And I think that's where my passion for the financial markets really took off um, working with guys uh, like in Tra Trafigura and Glencore um, and sort of seeing what they do with on the oil side, on the commodities side, how they, <laughs> how they manipulate things yeah. um, and how they play that contango games. And it's sort of like, and then it grew from there and it's like saying, okay, cool. This isn't so hard which was a big mistake because it is hard. It's <laughs> yeah, one of the hardest things that you <laughs> that you can do, but from the outside in, it looked a bit hard. And then I decided to go and trade for myself to, to handle my personal portfolio, but still I'm involved in the energy space doing consulting. And I've really re recently started doing other media stuff and locally in South Africa, but also abroad in America. But sort of that's where my love for I would say the financial markets grew is in commodities. Mm, yeah. So yeah, there's a, a book that I've been reading by Javier Blas, The World for Sale. And it goes through all of the uh the ways that they, they control them and they make absolutely huge profits, these commodity traders. Um and I think Glencore was came out of Mark Rich, I believe, or it might be the other way around, but a lot of them basically set up their own shop so it's quite a small knit place at the top it is a it is an absolute boys club if you go and look at just look at the price action of gold mm -hmm. um there's no reason why it should bear be where it is at the moment and i mean how many times have these big industry players been fined for you know spoofing or market manipulation and etc so i mean it 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 exists. There is no sort of, you can't deny that it exists. It does. We mm -hmm. can see it in, in the charts. But yeah, I mean, like I said, that's where my sort of um, fascination with the financial markets started because um didn't have a quite a traditional, you know, go and study finance, go and work for a, a, a in finance industry or in the finance industry sort of um, introduction uh, to the markets so i didn't have that cookie cutter approach it's sort of had to find my own way um mm. uh, in a manner of speaking yeah so do you mostly trade commodities then rocco or do you trade stocks so i think you trade industry funny yeah well. funny enough i I find commodities very tough to trade just because mm -hmm. of, like, for instance, oil. There is so much geopolitical nature. I can, I'm comfortable in the analysis of this, and I'll sort of touch on it later. But for me, I like indices just because they are not as volatile as stocks or individual stocks. So, for instance, in Europe, I love the DAX. Um, DAX is, was sort of my first introduction to indices and to charts. So, um, I think it's for most people it is. They start with a DAX. And from there, um, looking at um, the NASDAQ and pr pretty much, I would say, the, uh, not even the Dow, but just for me, I'm fluctuating between the DAX and the NASDAQ at the moment, just because you can sort of, and on our time zone, the South African time zone, it's easy to trade in the morning or take a trade in the morning and then take a trade in the afternoon and then boom, you're done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
this surely is quite hard to trade indices though because they're essentially a basket of stocks so if i look at a stock price chart yeah um, you know i can see support and i can see resistance and i can see where people are going to come in and put orders into the market so we'll have the stop loss liquidity there'll be a lot of orders around there um same for resistance there'll be sort of sell orders above there buy orders to buy the breakout things like that but when it comes to indices mm-hmm. that is that price is reflecting a basket so is it is it not harder to technically trade because you're not actually trading the asset you're trading a, a basket you see Does that, that my sense? my answer would be that i don't know because <laughs> that is what my introduction was to trading it's like and I guess that's the beauty is, and also the hardship is it depends on what your introduction was to the market, right? Mm-hmm. Because what works for me won't necessarily work for you. And if you find something that works, then don't go and dabble outside and looking for other things. It's like, I've tried my hand at individual stocks. I failed m- trading, not like investing for long term. I said mm-hmm. trading just because, and then the they seem to move very fast or always seem to move against me. And then I sort of just found the flow of indices uh, much better just because they are, and this is again, this is my perception, but not as sort of, um, you know, I mean, look at the, look at the NASDAQ, right? It's just three or four major companies propping it up. So, I mean, if those companies have, if you buy into strength and you sell into weakness, then you can't really go wrong. So, so, so to answer your question is like, yeah, might be, but that's for, that was my introduction. And that's Mm. to me is that's what I know. So I, yeah, that's basically, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's quite interesting. I've never, actually traded indices um but for example in 2020 we had the the covid collapse now mm-hmm. i was short like 20 plus stocks um and i have a friend who pretty much just shorted uh two indices and did incredibly well you know without all the commission fees and the staring of of different charts you know his view was that everything was going to go down uh, so he's me, uh, you know, shorting breakdowns and looking for things to short, whereas he just put on one trade, yeah, um, which is so much easier because everything was going down. But that's so. So I think you just basically answered your own question. It's like, why? Why did he do that and you do something else? It's because he does something that basically he's comfortable with, mm. uh, and that was his introduction to the market. So a lot of it depends on what your introduction was. If you're learning to trade individual stocks, you're probably going to master that very quickly. And if you are learning to trade indices, then you're, you know, what the 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 case might might be the same. And but the mm. the, the where I would differ is going to commodities and going into crypto, where it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. Yeah, crypto is uh, just just crazy. Um, it's not something I've ever done. Um, I do know a chap who's done incredibly well out with it, but I, I also know he does quite a lot of research and uh, doesn't just pile into things, which seems to be what a lot of people were doing, at least. I think they've all done their own now. Um, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, well, basically, as I can analyze it, right, but I don't have the conviction to trade it. It does that make sense? It's like if mm. you have a low conviction, right? So now this is currently with the current market situation. Um, I have very low conviction to take any positions. And if you're doing that, then your risk management needs to be very tight. Because if you mm. don't even if you if you're not hundred, no, no, you can't be hundred percent sure. If you're not 75% sure or 80% sure of 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 your trade, then yeah, and your risk management isn't there, then you are just asking for for trouble. So yeah, for so for crypto, my my I don't have any conviction. Mm. Yeah, same. I, I just don't understand it, so I don't trade it. I mean, I have have traded frauds on the stock market before, but you know, I knew 
why yes. I was trading it because I knew that people would actually carry on buying it. Um, yeah. So I would just buy it for that reason. Um, but you have conviction. That's the thing. It's, it's like yeah, you exactly. Had conviction I know. That you I know what the why. trade is. Yes. Yeah. So exactly. for me, is I still don't know. Well, at least no one has no one has empirically proven to me what Bitcoin is or why it moves the way that it does. I just mm. know that sometimes it sort of um, moves in lockstep with the Nasdaq, but sometimes it diverges as well. And we have all these narratives about what it is and why. At least with a Nasdaq, I know that hey, this is a basket of goods. This yeah. is price <laughs> at the current. You know, this is the price at current levels. The uh, this is the uh, people buying, selling. With Bitcoin, I don't know. That just yeah, it might be wrong or right. But this is my. If I don't have conviction, then what mm. am I basing my trade off of? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it sounds like a good. A good solid tip to you know to at least have conviction in what you trade otherwise it's it's going to be pretty tough um but yes. are, are there any other things that you've learned Rocco during during your journey um keep it very simple um at the start I I sort of like to overcomplicate everything because I was looking for the magic indicator I was looking mm -hmm. for the holy grail I was looking for if I have this thing, then I would be successful. Instead of just, you know, learning the basics and the fundamentals and and doing that very well, and like you only need one or two, maximum three strategies that you can know by heart, and look at a chart and say, okay, cool, that's the setup. You learn mm. sort of, you know, the, you when you build that screen time and it just just clicks you just look at a chart and you just go boom okay i've this is what's happening xyz so for people out there starting it's i see a lot of people looking for that elusive thing that they think uh, is going to help them or change their their luck or something mm. like that and the truth is that in the past don't say five, six years, ten years. There, there hasn't been a significant breakthrough in trading indicators that has revolutionized the industry um, that much. It's all everything is there for you. It's online. It's like you know, going to people like yourself or buying other successful traders' your courses or whatever it, your case may be, but. Everything is there, just it needs you need to be sort of it needs to be here, right? You need to be yeah, the focus like is it as as easy as you can make you need to make it as easy as uh, um, uh, it can be for yourself. Just because something works for you doesn't mean that it's gonna work for me. And that's one of the problems I have with things like copy trading. Mm. Um it's that you don't know what the risk risk profile is like you don't know what the yeah you don't know what the risk reward is if and you become so dependent on other people and other things and if if that goes away then you're really in trouble because what are you going to depend on you, you know it's it's you need to rely on yourself I said yeah. a lot there. I said a lot there, but I think it boils. Yeah, I think it it boils down to finding something simple that works and just wash, rinse, and repeat. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's at the heart, like you said. I know you're a big fan of saying this. Like it needs to be boring. If if you're <laughs> at all, if you're getting excited, then you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my charts are, are very, very simple. I mean, I've got uh, daily candlesticks, volume, and uh, moving averages, and and that's mm. that's actually it. I used to have RSI, uh, relative strength index. Yes, yes. I realised yes. I just couldn't trade it at all. Um, I couldn't find any way of actually profitably trading it, so I got rid of it. Um, so it's all about price action, supply, demand. Uh, which levels are, are people interested mm -hmm. in? 
Um, you look for significant breakouts, significant breakdowns, um, big volume, and that's pretty much it. Um, and then sometimes I might take a view based on the stock's fundamentals or the news. Um, so, for example, this morning, uh, Jules uh, gapped up and rose to stock in the UK because Next had proposed to invest in it. Um, so, so that was a discretionary view based on a gap up. Um, you know, it was a surprise to the market, so I thought it would continue to to go up. Um, so I tried to take that trade. Uh, unfortunately, my prime has has now moved prime, so I didn't get filled, which is annoying. And I can guarantee, if it had been a losing trade, I uh, would have been filled. Um, but yeah, c- keeping it simple, definitely, I agree with that. And and keeping it boring because, you know, if you're risking, um, you know, twenty percent of your capital on a single trade, you know, that's. That's definitely not boring. Um, no, but it, it no, it isn't. Buying. <laughs> big uh, fan of the two percent. Big fan of the two percent mm-hmm. per trade rule. Um, it's there for a reason, and I feel the people that follow it have been there. You know, or it just allows you to p- participate in the market for a longer time than yeah. say moving it higher. Um, just to speak on 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 the strategy a bit. So for me, um, I'm I'm just a big fan of what I just call triple confirmation. It just means that, or triple filtering, uh, people call it a lot of things. But if I know my direction and I know the momentum and I know, you know, above or below moving averages or, or pivot lines and stuff like that on my price chart, then I can put a conviction trade on it. But, and then just looking at confluence across time frames. um, if if you look at a chart and let's say you've got 15 minutes, an hour, and your day open, for instance, mm. and everything is just giving you mixed signals and everything isn't moving in the same direction, then you close that chart or you close your laptop and you go and do something else. It's I've see, I see so a lot of oh, I see a lot of uh, people saying um, I I. I I don't know, or I don't know in which direction is this market moving. And then I'm like, okay, cool. But then it's gambling. Then it's a, yeah. if <laughs> it's a 50, it's a, if, if it's a 50, 50, then we need to say, okay, cool. But we're gambling now. And that's why I get, I get a bit angry when people say trading is gambling. It's because in a sense, yes, you're putting a bet on, but it's a high conviction bet. It's like a 75, for me, it's a 75% bet. And if it doesn't work out, then there's our risk management um, in place in the forms of uh, stop losses um, that that you can use. I know you had a great post the other day about um, placing your stop loss too tight. Um, Ah, yeah. Yeah. And we've seen, we've, we've seen that, this this cycle it's it's really punishing um tight let's say tight risk management and it's like yeah you can you can go either way right because you might get stopped out of one or two trades but in the end of the day your your account isn't going to get wiped out no well that's that's what stop losses are are there for yeah but uh definitely in choppier markets like this it makes sense to to widen the stop and, and decrease the size because yeah, otherwise yes. you you just get stopped down. Um, I, I don't like this market at all. Um, it's the ranges are very tight. It's um, uh, I the 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 base move was the correction, right? It's hmm. it's it moved with purpose. It moved with um the volume and now i looked at the dax this morning there is just no volume i don't know if you've picked up on but the volume is really low yeah i mean so my market's completely different to yours i guess rocco um obviously okay. i'm small cap stocks but a lot of it will depend on private investor cash so at the moment nobody really wants to buy anything so we're not getting cash inflows and people are rather taking money out of their account. So, you know, there's there's sort of net selling across yes. lots of stocks. So we see good news gets sold into 
Um, and there's, you know, there might be good news, but no one really wants to buy because everyone's wary of the cost of living crisis and just the market's a bit sour at the moment. But yeah, there's there's definitely been a shift down in volume, um, unless there's a profit warning, in which case everyone wants to sell and volume ramps up, um, but the price goes down. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, it's summer so, as well. Well, I mean, just to give you an example, um, on um, when the correction started, um, you used to get like two, three percent moves per day, which I mean, that's a trader's dream, mm. right? That is just that's quite a lot on the DAX, yeah. That is all that is not even bread and butter money, that is like December bonus money, right? Mm. <laughs> so, this morning I was looking at entry levels, um, 13668. Um, target was just perv D, which for for people that might might not be familiar with the term, it's just a pivot point. It's your daily pivot point, right. um, and it was I had perv D as thirteen six two four, uh, sorry thirteen six two two, and it hit thirteen six two four before turning, and I sort of got out there that range, which was forty five pips, um. 0.34 percent which is not a lot but it's basically that's what i'm when the market is like this open it up in the morning is an opportunity oh yeah there might be a little short put it on, on get out and go and do something else it mm. you really can't spend the whole day um looking for trades or looking for setups when i'm again talking about the indices when there is no volume then you're just looking to be caught on the wrong side. Yeah. And I guess it's it's probably easy if you to just, just walk away because you've got other things going on. Um so I mean I know when I was a I mean, you know, I still am a full time trader, but I have a, a business, I do a bit of yes. consulting yes. as well. You know, when I was a hundred percent focused on the market, um and when I was in my first couple of years, I, I'd always want to trade. So I'd always try and find a trade, you know, I'd go yeah. on Twitter or I'd look at the, <laughs> look at my monitor and and see see if anything was moving and, and try and force it. Yes. Um, but you, you've just got to be patient and, and wait for the trade. I've found that's that's helped me a lot when I've just sat out the market and sat out and waited for the right setup. I wish Kramer was there, uh, like, or you know what I mean? It's like, mm. just look at the contra people. I'm joking, but they would, like <laughs> take, take contra positions on, on, on Twitter. Um, mm. yeah. What you're saying is resonating with me a lot. It's like, I, I'm more, I'm more confident in my analysis than my ability as a trader. And, it's fine because I know myself and I sort of know what works for me and what doesn't. And I can have an addicting personality. Um, so yeah, for me, when it comes no, to uh, but, 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 but it's like, Oh, you're, you're an addict. No, I'm not an addict, <laughs> but I can, I, I know when something is going to become addicting and I try to, um find ways around it or coping mechanisms and the one was hey i need you to go and do other stuff okay cool what are we going to do right let's go and, you, and then you go and do the things that or you build the things that you know and you, and you love doing but it just allows you to switch or to to put the laptop down switch off because i don't believe in walking away from from charts and they are on in the background um mm. because my personality will go oh that's it's gonna do that now it's gonna you know and i need to do this i need to take this trade but then um over trading is a really really it's something that i see um i still see a lot it's yeah. because of the euph euphoria of winning and then you, when the worst thing that can happen is when you hit like two three four trades in a row and, and they all are wins or work yeah. out and then you start having that overconfidence of, oh, I, man, this is nothing. I can <laughs> sort of, I can do this with my eyes closed. This is, and then it just, you get absolutely taken out with a, a piece of news that, you know, no indicator can show you or 
um, you get on the wrong side of a track, you you, you miss something on a higher time frame. Um, and then it's like, and then you get into that. I mean, all traders have been in that space. Yeah, Martin, yeah, that. Martin, <laughs> Martin Galing, right? Where you try to fix something by taking bigger opposite positions or, I mean, I feel that's like a rite of passage as well. And like failure in trading doesn't need to be looked at as, oh, it's a horrendous thing. As long as you learn from it and you move into something that works for you, then it's fine. Mm. But if you can just continue to fail, 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 I think after a while, you need to reconsider what you're doing, walking away, coming back or saying, hey, this isn't for me. Yeah, I mean, I think if you if you use proper position sizing, yes. um, you know, you've, you've got a chance of actually learning and overcoming that. But if you go mm-hmm. too heavy um, in a stock and you lose, you know, let's say you lose 10 percent of your capital, then another trade you lose five percent, and then another five percent. You can you can very quickly lose a lot of your capital and not really have learned that much. Um, and I I don't believe in demo accounts because yes. yeah they're good, they're good to learn how to press the buttons and everything like that. But but you've got to actually put money on the line because when it's a demo you're not you're not emotionally invested. You know, so you've got to actually trade with something small enough to mean something. But not big enough that it's like painful. So to lose. yeah, so yeah, so Michael, I wished I had someone to tell me that um, mm. because I paper traded for a long time. Trying when you're trying to figure out something, or you're trying to figure out how it works, and then you think you know or you have it under uh, control, and then what no one tells you is that once you are trading with real money or in the, because if you're paper trading, it's still a real uh, market um, data. It's yeah. not a simulation. Mm. So it's 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 not like you're back testing and I can configure things um, to, to, to suit um, my portfolio and stuff like that. So paper trading is still, it's real, right? So, but the problem is shifting from paper trading into real trading. Um, uh, the, the, the stress like goes from, two three to 11 and 12 it just shoots yeah uh and and i sort of knocked me back man it's it's um to 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 a point where i had no confidence and traders are 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 people of confidence if if my confidence is low i i just do something else. i just walk away as well saying if you're sick i think that's sensible though if you're sick, no, but I mean, it mm-hmm. doesn't, it didn't used to be like that. It's like I, I had to find these things are, you know, sort of trial and error as, as yeah. you go along. Um, but if, if, if you're such, if your relationship, so then you've got a girlfriend, you've got a wife or kids or whatever, if your relationship is in a bad place, it's likely going to reflect oh, in yeah. your work. Mm. um uh if if you are mentally in a in a bad spot then you don't even want to be opening um a, a computer or a laptop so mm. yeah that, that that's basically just some uh, some life advice there so but but what you're saying is very true uh, mm. about paper paper trading and i i feel like a lot of brokers they they want you to open oh, maybe we're going to get in trouble for saying this but they <laughs> want you to open that paper trading account because they want to get you hooked mm. um if 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 i had if it was me i would just say put in 100 or 500 quid or whatever it is and start with very small position sizes and work your way up from there i would take paper trading out of the out of the equation completely yeah. Yeah. I think once you've done two or three trades, so you understand the buttons, then you got to go on to live because um, it, it's just not the same. I mean, everyone, everyone can um, put a stop loss in. Everyone can take profits on the demo. But yes. then when it's real money and you're thinking, you know, whatever it is in terms of, of the quantum, um, yes. you know, yes. are you down, you know, a couple of hours work, are you down a month's salary, are you down, you know, a, a world cruise or whatever. It's it, then it then it's real, 
Um, mm, absolutely. And, and on a demo, it's it's just not real. It means nothing. Um, yeah. It gives you a false sense of accomplishment because mm. you've accomplished nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I quite like that. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so is, is there anything else, Rocco, that you've, that you've learned that you think might be useful? Um, I would say, well, we, we've talked about overtrading, mm. right? Um, we've talked about risk management. What have we, God help me, what, what have we left out? Um, I, f- I feel like you've you've covered some really great things so far. Um, so I just want to keep you going. <laughs> <laughs> keep you going. Um, uh, I would say block out the noise. Yeah, I, 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 that that, that is that is one. Um, I'm on Twitter and I'm on LinkedIn as an escape from my work, not to pick up information or base my trades off of other people's ideas, mm. and it's sort of. When you go onto Twitter or FinTwit, as they call it, and you see a lot of cloud chasing. Um, yeah, definitely. For instance, yeah. I know and I follow your content uh, since you've been on my podcast religiously. And I know you also, you don't like to give that much advice because if you yeah, are just... Well, I try not to. I can offer my opinion, but... Um... Yeah, yeah, but but, th- th- but that's the thing. It's not hashtag not financial advice. It's because these people with massive accounts. Okay, cool. So let's say you are a, you're a novice trader, right? So you just starting out, and you go onto Twitter, and there is this guy with a hundred or one hundred and twenty thousand followers. The reason being, or probability in your head, is that hey, this person must know what they are talking about and Mm. this person um, would be a great person to learn from um, if I follow their ideas and I copy their uh, trade ideas and stuff like that the problem is that there is no accountability or accountability is not um, how can I put this accountability is not taught in on Twitter because if I put out a tweet and it's wrong, I can just go back and delete it. Or I can say, yeah. oh, no, that's not, that's not what I meant. Or, uh, yeah, you know, you need to take your or your own responsibility. Yeah, okay, cool. But why are you putting out that content as you are looking for cloud? Everyone in, in on Fin Twitter is at in some way, shape, or form trying to grow their own following, trying mm-hmm. to grow their own base. and. And if they are giving, if they are wrong, they rarely take responsibility and say, "I was wrong for this call." X, this is why X, Y, Z. And at the end of the day, it's just it's the novice people that get burnt. I feel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I did that. Uh, followed someone on Twitter because uh, they just posted a tweet. So I thought, oh, they're buying now, so I'll buy now. And <laughs> that person was probably selling. <laughs> So no, yeah, yeah, you learn, and, you learn uh, pretty quickly, and um, and and don't don't discard the Bloomberg's and mm-hmm. um, the Fox business, and um, when when that news gets very loud, right? That news cycle. I mean, look look at this bounce that 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 happened now. It's like that was just like the bearish news was deafening. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, what happened, the market went into a bounce. And now it's like, oh, yeah, whatever. But like people who were late to the party, they caught that news and they got burned based off of um, the the news cycle. So news is noise. You need to take everything out of the equation. If you're trading on fundamentals, let those be your guiding light. If you're trading on technicals, mm-hmm. let that be your, your guiding light. Do not listen to... Um, anyone else because at yeah. the end of the day right you are beholden to yourself not to anyone else mm-hmm. there's, a, there's a good example of, of that don't listen to the news with um, the economist contra indicator oh. I, I think it's the economist um, so every time they, they post something you know serious about oil or gold or bitcoin or whatever it's usually a, a time to, to t- take the opposite position yeah, it's uh, there is this great cover that says uh, text two trillion dollar bull run, 
um, <laughs> just before the COVID correction and everything. I mean, we know what happened. Mm. It's, I find it, I still find it hard, you know, to, who controls the media and what are those, or what are their interests in pushing a narrative to, because I mean, in, like in financial markets, someone needs to get in for you to get out and someone mm. needs to get out for you to get in. And if we're pushing certain news in the media, trying to get everyone moving in a certain direction, then obviously, you know, we that's one way of doing that. Mm. It's it's through through what you just said. Yeah. I mean it through through all forms of, of media. Yeah, be it social or financial press or whatever. Um yeah, you definitely need to be careful so i would agree with that yeah um so i think now is probably a good time to wrap it up rocco i mean thanks a lot it's been an absolute pleasure and i will put your twitter and linkedin in the bio below this video um but you also have a, a podcast as well that i've been on do you want to just explain about that a little bit as well yeah it's called the sgm podcast so it's it's every wednesday on where all good podcasts are, are found and essentially mm -hmm. it's the it's trying to put a spotlight on people that i find to be putting out quality content and that people need to to go and take a listen at but they might not have the biggest following out there or they they don't do a lot of podcasts and it's mm -hmm. just getting those people and i find um once i've had those people on their accounts grow and their sort of um content creation journey becomes a lot easier mm -hmm. and it's yeah it's just about giving that platform to to people that i really think deserve it because the social media is funny it's like we idolize these you know, the, yeah the, the, these um uh, uh, Kramers and Kathy Woods and all these people <laughs> of the world but then we it's and especially because it's so hard to grow organically on social media these days it's like mm -hmm. I just found that hey this is maybe something that I can do to help the cause because the better information there is the better um, education there is the better for market participants everywhere yeah yeah i definitely agree um yeah and i'll put a link to the podcast below as well so if you want to check out Rocco, rocco's podcast and um, just look, look in the show notes below this um yeah so thanks again rocco as i say it's an absolute pleasure and hopefully we will speak soon again cheers